In February 2009, videos surfaced on the internet of a man who disguised his face and digitally altered his voice, claiming to be a serial killer operating throughout the United States. He was confident of his elusiveness and called himself Catch Me Killer. The man claimed to have 16 victims to his credit. The confessions of the mysterious maniac caused widespread panic. He gave the exact names of the missing girls and threatened that the number of victims would grow. The geographical spread of the crimes was enormous. Among the 16 victims was the name of Tara Grinstead from Georgia. She disappeared four years ago. That's when a latex glove was found on her doorstep. DNA analysis revealed that the glove was once on a man's hand. By then, DNA testing had been done on several suspects, but no matches were found. Digital experts have helped identify the man who recorded the video on behalf of the killer. Police have arrested 27-year-old Andrew Haley. He admitted to have made the videos but called his actions a joke. After a series of interrogations, detectives were convinced that Haley had nothing to do with the criminal offenses he confessed to. Wanting fame, he got a list of recently missing girls and decided to pass himself off as the killer. DNA tests confirmed he had nothing to do with the disappearance of Tara Grinstead. Andrew Haley was tried and sentenced to two years in prison for perjury and obstruction of justice, and the search for Tara Grinstead continued. The investigation to unravel the mystery of her disappearance went on for 11 years. Tara Grinstead was born on the 14th of November 1974 to Bill and Faye Grinstead. She had a sibling, Anita. The family lived in Hawkinsville, Georgia, a tiny town of less than 3,000 people. According to Maria Woods Harbor, Tara's friend, she was the kindest and most caring little girl with a charming smile. The girl dreamed of getting education. The money was not enough, and Tara began to participate in beauty contests as the participants received bonuses for the prize. In 1999, she went to the city of Tifton and won the title of Miss City, which gave her the right to participate in the contest, Miss Georgia. Performing at the state level was not so successful, but Tara was persistent. She applied and traveled to similar competitions on a smaller scale. Her wins helped pay for her college tuition, after which she began teaching history at Osceola High School. Tara, unlike most girls participating in beauty contests, did not dream of a modeling career. She was content with living the province and having a career of a teacher. She combined her work with her studies at the university. In 2005, she received a master's degree in education and told to people who knew her that she wanted to become a school principal. Tara's age no longer allowed her to participate in beauty contests, but she was now invited as a counselor to young contestants. On Saturday, the 22nd of October, 2005, the young woman was present behind the scenes of such a contest. She helped one of the contestants to do her hair and makeup. Afterwards, she went to a barbecue at the invitation of a graduate of the school where she worked. She left from there at 11 p.m. On Monday, October 24th, Tara Grinstead did not turn up for her lessons. This was completely unlike her. The girl never missed work without a valid excuse. She would have definitely let the school administration know if she needed to take a day off. Tara's phone was silent. The school staff contacted police chief Billy Hancock. Osceola is a small town, and at 10 a.m. Bill already arrived at the girl's house. The policeman thought that her phone was just dead, and she was either sick or didn't hear the alarm clock. Tara's car was parked in its usual place outside the house. The open doors of the car did not arouse suspicion. The townspeople knew each other. They did not lock their doors or use the alarm system. However, when the police chief looked inside the car, he was surprised. There was an envelope on the dashboard of the auto, and inside there was a hundred dollars. That surprised the cop. Everyone knew that Tara was neat, careful, and even overly frugal. It was unlikely she would have left the money in the car in a conspicuous place. Billy knocked on the door of the house, but no one answered. Then he decided to go inside. At first glance, everything seemed fine. No signs of violence or intrusion. But in Tara's bedroom, he found a complete mess, and it wasn't like her to have it. Her belongings were scattered on the floor. Among them, there were the clothes she had been wearing on Saturday at the contest and later at the picnic. A mobile phone lay on a cushion, plugged in to charge. Everything looked like Tara had just left the house and would be back soon. But she was neither in the house nor near it. 
On the ground near the house, police found the first trace that made them think of a possible crime. It was a latex glove that could have been worn to avoid leaving fingerprints. Detectives ruled out the possibility that the glove could have belonged to Tara. It didn't look like something for everyday use. After it became clear that Tara's disappearance was not a voluntary departure from home, but a crime, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, an analog of the FBI at the state level, joined the work. The main theory was kidnapping. The beautiful girl had admirers. One of them, not waiting for reciprocal feelings, could have kidnapped her. There was almost no evidence. Except for the glove, they found only two suspicious things. A broken chain and an alarm clock lying on the floor. The news of the incident spread throughout the town within minutes. Neighbors, people who knew the girl and just onlookers flocked to the house. The police had to cordon it off. A meeting was called at the school. Tara's colleagues and students wanted to help in the search. They gathered a group of volunteers who distributed flyers with the young woman's photo and information about her disappearance all over the city. Agents of the Bureau of Investigations questioned the neighbors. Snooper dogs were used in the search inside of the latex glove. Experts were able to obtain DNA data. Not a single match was found in the FBI database. The only thing the analysis showed was that the glove was worn by a man. Tara's longest and most serious relationship was with Marcus Harper, an ex-police officer who joined the military and participated in U.S. military operations overseas. They broke up a year ago. Tara dreamed of marriage and children, while Marcus felt it was too early for him to burden himself with a family. Friends said that despite the breakup of the relationship, they remained on good terms and sometimes communicated by phone or on the internet. Detectives were intrigued by one curious fact. Three weeks before the teacher's disappearance, Marcus came to Osilla, but did not inform his ex-girlfriend about his coming. Tara got to know about his arrival by accident. Marcus's behavior really offended her. She called him several times and angrily reproached him for not announcing himself. With each call, her condition became more and more hysterical. It came to a serious psychological breakdown. Tara's relatives were in panic about her condition and even asked her with caution if she was planning to do something to herself. After a few days, Tara calmed down. At the insistence of the police, Marcus took a DNA test. The results did not match the DNA on the glove. All suspicions of Marcus's involvement in her disappearance were lifted. The guy had no reason to kill her. In Tara's house, the police found a business card of some policeman. It turned out that the girl had been dating him for a short time. But when Tara disappeared, he already lived in another city. The policeman also proved that he was far from Tara on the night of her disappearance. The list of possible suspects was exhausted at this point. The investigation decided that it was necessary to focus on the search for Tara herself, alive or dead. The police involved hundreds of volunteers who searched the Osilla district. They made their way through the forests, checked abandoned houses, garages, workshops, ditches, and rivers, but found nothing. During the search, an incident occurred. A house and a car burned down near Tara's home. Many local residents thought that these two events could be somehow related. Rumors spread that the owners kept Tara alive in the basement, and when the risk of her being found increased, they burned down their own house. The search for remains at the fire site was unsuccessful. The unfortunate fire victims could not understand why they were suspected of kidnapping their neighbor. Soon, the investigation concluded that the fire was the result of an accident and had nothing to do with the girl's disappearance. The investigation into the disappearance of Tara Grinstead stalled and did not progress for several years. In December 2010, after five years had passed, the court was forced to declare Tara Grinstead dead and transfer the case to the archives. The city of Osilla began to be considered throughout the country to be a community with a code of silence. No one doubted that the criminal was there and is probably now among the 3,000 inhabitants, and it is impossible that no one knew about his deed. The resident's defensive reaction was a taboo on any conversations about Tara and her disappearance. As one visiting journalist remarked, everyone thought about it, but no one wanted to talk about it. The city changed for the worse. Fear and mistrust enveloped it for many years. In 2016, Atlanta journalist Bane Lindsay created a podcast dedicated to the investigation of mysterious crimes. For the first episode, he chose the case of Tara Grinstead. 
While preparing the program, he came to Osilla and met there with private investigator Maurice Goodwin, and they decided to start a private investigation. They did not have access to official data. They had to interview the residents of the city and Tara's loved ones. At first, they were only able to talk to her relatives. The rest of the people shunned the new investigators. But Bain Lindsay, with his enthusiasm, managed to arouse curiosity, and soon the residents of Osilla began talking about Tara again. Investigators started again with three potential suspects, the girl's former lovers and the student who tried to break into her house. The first big revelation was the information that Tara's ex-boyfriend, Marcus Harper, who had long ago left the city and even the state, was serving a prison sentence for the murder of his wife. A new version was emerging. The ranger, who had been in various military situations, did not stop before killing when his relationship with a woman came to a standstill. However, a recheck of Marcus showed that this logic did not work. He had nothing to do with Tara's murder. One day, journalist Lindsay received a phone call from a stranger, advising him to look for a girl's body on the land plot of her house. The journalist gave the information to the police. They dug up the entire land plot and found bones, but experts quickly determined that they were the remains of an animal. The previous owner of the house 50 years ago buried his dog on the plot. All the journalists' efforts came to nothing. Bain Lindsay's broadcast about the disappearance of the Osilla teacher ended with an ellipsis. But it was this amateur investigation that became the key to the long-awaited denouement. In early 2017, a woman named Brooke Sheridan came forward to the police. She said that her ex-boyfriend, Bo Dukes, had once confessed to helping a friend dispose of Tara Grinstead's body. Brooke assured the police that she had asked her boyfriend to confess to the police several times, but he refused and he seemed to regret that he had spoken out. The detectives put a wiretap on Brooke and asked her to talk about this story with Bo. It worked. Bo Dukes did not deny his guilt. The police had grounds for arrest. At the time of his arrest, Dukes was scared and immediately agreed to cooperate with the investigation. He said that he had been carrying the burden of his conscience on his soul for too long, so he was ready to tell everything he knew. According to him, on October 22, 2005, shortly after midnight, he was about to go to bed when he received a phone call from a friend. He had been friends with Ryan Duke since school. Their last names were next to each other on all class lists, Duke and Dukes. Ryan called and asked to rent a truck to help him with one thing. Bo Dukes knew one 24-hour parking lot, but he asked his friend why he couldn't rent the car himself. Ryan, in a trembling voice, explained that he was afraid of giving himself away. He said into the phone, I've committed a terrible crime. I broke into Tara Grinstead's house to steal some cash, but things went wrong and I killed her. Bo arrived at the scene in a truck. Together, they loaded Tara's body into the truck and took it to the woods. Ryan was wearing latex gloves. The residents of Osilla could not believe it. Dukes and Duke had never aroused suspicion. They had no reason to kill. Nevertheless, the facts spoke for themselves. After 11 years, the perpetrators had been found and arrested. The first testimony came from the suspect in the murder. Ryan Duke confessed that he had had a fun night out with friends at a Saturday party. He had been drinking and decided to go for a drive. On the way, he got the idea to break into someone's house and steal some cash. He chose Tara's house. Ryan easily opened the door with a credit card and entered. He began to search the house for money. Tara heard him. She attacked the burglar, and he had no choice but to kill her. Ryan Duke's testimony was inconsistent. He first claimed that he had killed the victim by hitting her over the head, and then that he had strangled her. But there was no doubt left when the former friends showed the location of the burial of the unfortunate Tara. The condition of the bones and skull indicated that the body had been burned. After 11 years, the remains had deteriorated in the damp forest so badly that it was impossible to determine the exact cause of death. DNA analysis showed that the latex glove was on the hand of Ryan Duke, who had confessed to the murder. The trial of the accomplice, Bo Dukes, took place in 2019. He fully admitted his guilt, but exercised his right not to testify against himself in court. At the trial, Bo addressed Tara's family, sobbing and apologizing to them for helping the killer cover up the crime the lawyer tried to reduce the sentence. Dukes had served in the army, was a military veteran and had many awards, but the court was inexorable 
25 years in prison for assisting in the concealment of a crime. Three years later in 2022, the jury trial of Ryan began, and the killer on the first hearing refused his confession, claiming that Tara was actually killed by his friend Bo. Ryan's lawyer argued that the defendant made his confession under the influence of medical drugs and that he was very afraid of retaliation from his mate. Ryan claimed that he did not know how Tara died. He had not been to her house. Bo killed and hid the body, and only the next morning it was Bo who asked Ryan to help move and burn the body, not the other way around. The defense said the latex glove proved nothing. It was indeed on Bo's hand and Ryan had left it outside Tara's house on purpose to avert suspicion. The prosecutor called the change of testimony a ruse and insisted the killer was in front of the jury. The jury was left to decide whether they believed what Ryan said in 2017 or his new version of events. After deliberating, the jury acquitted Ryan Duke of the murder charge but found him guilty of concealing evidence. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Thus, a legal paradox occurred. Two people were convicted of concealing the murder for different terms, while neither of them was found guilty of the murder itself. This angered journalists and residents of the town, but the family of the murdered girl expressed satisfaction. Tara's mother said that until the last moment she had hoped that her daughter was alive. Now that she knows she is not, it doesn't matter so much to her which of the two perpetrators is more to blame.